Well, hello, my YouTube fellows and gals. So today we are working on lot 13 of romance books, and these are all hardbacks. They're all three dollars each. I, hi, my name is Tammy. If you're new to my channel, I own a used bookstore, and you can get a hold of me through Tammy's Makeup Treats at gmail.com, or you can contact me on Facebook under Minda's Bookstore and more. And if you don't read books, but you read with the tech gadget, well, I'm also a resource center that if you're interested in these books, you can go look them up and you can go have fun reading because I love books. It's one of my passions in life. So I try to do 10 books per video and read the synopsis so you know what the book's about. And then in the description below, I will list all the authors' names and all that good stuff and the ISBN number so you can go find them. So the first book of the day is called Cruel Legacy by Penny Jordan. This is what the book looks like. It's purple. I don't know why it shows up blue, but it's purple. This is a 1994 copyright. There's pen writing on the third page. Get a little bit of pen there. And I think that's about it. I try to clean them up as best I can so you have a really good reading book. So this is what it's about. Cruel Legacy is a Penny Jordan at her best. The story moves gracefully through the lives of four women as they learn to redefine themselves in their relationships and to hold on to their faith in each other and in love. The tragic truth behind wealthy industrialist Andrew Reichardt's sudden death shatters the lives of his family, friends, and employees. One man's life has come to an end, but for those left behind, it's just the beginning. Philippia, her pretty looks and manners reflect an Andrew's success and power, but her husband's death brings financial disaster, and now for the first time in her life, Philippia must prove to everyone and to herself that she is a woman who can stand alone. Sally. When Andrew Reichardt's factory closes, her husband Joel loses his job with the family financial well-being resting on her shoulders, unable to bridge the widening distance she feels with Joel Sally finds herself tempted by another man. Deborah. Deb has been promoted and now she must foreclose on Andrew Reichardt's estate. The job brings her close to a ruthless and ambitious man. And as her lover, Mark, struggles with his own demons, Deborah is forced to take a hard look at the future. And Elizabeth. Philippia's counselor and devoted mother and wife, she is supportive of her, her husband, Richard. A brilliant surgeon who's being forced into early retirement. Richard is afraid of the emptiness and loss of purpose in his life. And Elizabeth doesn't know how to help him. So there you go. Sounds pretty intense with all those women and their lives. So that's book one. Book number two, we have Commitments by Barbara Delinsky. It's got some writing inside the cover. That's what the book looks like. It is a 1988 copyright, and this is what it's about. Writer Sabrina Stone had married wealthy and unwisely. Her husband's refusal to love her handicapped son added more strain to an already failing relationship. Yet Sabrina feels a commitment to her marriage, one she has vowed to honor. Then one day she encounters an investigative reporter named Derek McGill, who's writing a story on parents of special children. They speak only for a few minutes, but it is... It is long enough for the two of them to feel desire that stuns them, a desire they both assume must be re remain unfulfilled. Eight months later, Sabrina's husband is divorcing her, and Derek McGill is in prison for murder. Following an impulse, Sabrina travels to Derek's prison to tell him that she believes in his innocence. What started as an act of compassion will turn into a dangerous and passionate test of her courage as she tries to uncover who engineered Derek's conviction. And she will discover the meaning of one of the most important commitments of all. The one a woman makes to herself. The one that would determine the course of her life and the fate of her dreams she has for her child. <laughs> of all the books I've ever written, Commitments has been one of my favorites, says Barbara Delinsky. I still get tears in my eyes when I reread it. I wrote it in 1987 as a full-length novel that was different in many ways from the romances I was writing at the time. For one, it includes the male point of view and delves into the heart-rending heart family problems. In that sense, is a per precursor of my current work. Boy, that sounds like a good book. So that's book two. 
book number three, we have... This here is a two-in-one edition. It's On a Wild Night and On a Wicked Dawn by Stephanie Lawrence. I love it when I get more than one book in a book. <laughs> more than one story in a book, I should say. This is a 2002 copyright. Look at the back of that, how pretty that cover is. Big, thick book. And this is what it's about. On a wild night, headstrong and mean adventures where no respectable lady show looking for excitement, but her daring turns to panic when she finds herself quite out of her death unexpectedly. Martin Fulbridge, Earl of Dexter, comes to her rescue. He's exactly the sort of man Amina has been longing for, lean and sensuous, but can such a rake be sufficiently tamed? In On a Wicked Dawn, Amelia is stunned when Viscount Lucy and Ashford, a man she's been in love with for years, agrees to her marriage proposal. He insists on a proper courtship, leaving her hungry for those stolen moments when his kisses take her to the height of ecstasy, but Luke has hidden reasons for his tender seduction. Ooh. So there you go. Book three. Book number four. And I really like this author because she actually writes in college level. And there is a way you can find that out. I was taught in college that, you know, certain people write in like the eighth grade level. She writes in college level. Hers is A Wild Mountain Time by Rosamond Pilcher. This is a large print. This is what the book looks like. You can tell it's older. This is a 1978 copyright. There's no jacket. It's just a regular cover. Victoria Bradshaw was numb with boredom, and London was great and dull after a Christmas season. Oliver Dobbs, determined to succeed as a writer, had broken Victoria's heart, leaving her in order to marry a wealthy man's daughter, pregnant with his child. Now, two years later, his wife dead, he sweeps into Victoria's life again, on that cold February night, he urges her to come away with him and his young son, Tommy, whom he has abducted from his in-laws. Almost against her will, she travels with them to the Scottish Highlands. Hmm. The publishers thank the authors and publishers who have made available their works for Oliver Scroft series designed to feature the world's finest literature. Yes. This is cool. Anyway, so that's book number four. <laughs> I could go on and on about books. Book number five is The Secret Love by Stephanie Lawrence. That's what the book looks like. And then that's the back. This is a 2000 copyright, and this is what it's about. She was desperate for his help when a mysterious lady, her face hidden by a black veil, begs Gabriel Sinster for his help. He cannot refuse her plea, for despite her disguise, Gabri Gabrielle finds Gabriel mm, finds the woman alluring, and he is powerless to deny her, but he exacts payment as only a Sinster would demand. For each piece of information he uncovers, she must pay him in the form of a kiss. Ew. <laughs> Romance. He is powerless to resist. Lady Al Alethea Morwellen knows Gabriel is intrigued, but despite the sparks that fly between them, they have never passed a civil moment together. Yet as the stakes get higher, so does Gabri Gabriel's desire for payment. In each overpowering kiss, each passionate embrace, Alethea knows she will not be able to resist his ultimate seduction, but will what will happen when she reveals the truth? Mmm. So there you go. Book five. Okay. Book number six. We have the Queen of the Big Time. This is what it looks like. And then this here's got like something was lifted off there, like a label or something. This is a 2004 copyright, and this is what it's about. In the late 1800s, the residents of a small village in the Bari region of Italy on the shores of the Adriatic Sea made a mass migration to the promised land of America. They settled in Rosetto, Pennsylvania, and recreated their former lives, former lives in their new home. 
down to the very last detail of who lived next door to whom. The village's annual celebration of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, or the big time on the occasion is called by the young women who compete to be the pageant's queen, is the centerpiece of Rosetto's colorful old world tradition. The industries for Casa Luca's work, the land outside Rosetto Nella, the middle daughter of five, aspires to a genteel life in town, far from the rigors of farm life which have exacted a toll on her mother and forced her father to take extra work in the slate quarries to make ends meet. But Nella's dream of making her own fortune shift when she meets Renato Lanzara, a worldly, handsome, devil-may-care poet who has a way with words that makes him irresistible. Their friendship ignites into a fiery romance that Nella is certain will lead to marriage. But Nella is not alone in her pursuit. Every girl in town seems to want Renato. When he disappears without explanation, Nella is left with a shattered heart. Four years later, Renato's sudden return to Rosetto the night before Nella's wedding to the steadfast Franco Z Zolorano leaves her and the Castelluca family shaken. For although Renata has chosen a path very different from Nella's, they are fated to live and work in Rosetta, where the past hangs over them like a brewing storm. An epic of small town life into a glorious detail of the trademark. Trigeniani Tr style? Okay. <laughs> so anyways, that is book number six. Book number seven, we have Sweet Hush by Deborah Smith. The a little label in there. This is what the book looks like. This is a 2003 copyright, and this is what it's about. For Hush, McGillan images everything, and at 40, she's proud of the hush the world sees. Respected young widow, successful businesswoman, devoted mother, she's turned her family's Georgia apple orchard orchards into a booming modern enterprise that even sent her son davis to harvard harvard mm, i can't talk today tongue tied while still managing to hide the painful truth about her late husband and their tormented marriage but hush's careful construct is about to be put to the test because davis is soon going to turn the eyes of the whole world on hush and her family's closely guarded private life he arrives home mid-semester in a cloud of dust, secret service, and hot pursuit to present Hush with his new bride. Eddie Jacobs, or Edie Jacobs, Edie Jacobs, maybe the rebellious daughter of the President of the United States. Convinced that Davis uses ulterior motives and that their daughter's impetuous elopement is was somehow coerced, the President and First Lady sent a trusted family friend and deep cover agent to rescue the stubborn first daughter. Nicholas Jacobek is a hardened, world-weary operative who has retreated to the wilderness to escape the memories of the secret battles he's fought to protect his beloved family. When keeping Edie safe from his first priority once again, he doesn't expect the mission to include to have stolen his heart by red-haired firecracker named Hush. In Hush, who is trying desperately to keep her orchards running while protecting her son and new daughter-in-law from the media hordes that invade the farm is not prepared to be shaken to the core by the unexpected stranger's arrival. As Hush and Jacob Beck struggle to do what is best for the young couple, both must deal with the unfolding truths about their lives, their growing love for each other, and the consequences of living with private disgrace in a world that demands public sacrifices. Deborah Smith's trademark humor, warmth, and delight characters combine to create a wonderfully fresh, hilarious, and passionate story about finding the love when you least expect it. There you go. Book seven. Book number eight. We have From the Fields of Gold by Alexandra Ripley. That's what the book looks like. This is a 1995 copyright, and I believe this is in large print, too. Yep. And this is what it's about. The South Rises Again, this new novel by Alexander Ripley, the author of the multi-million copy mega hit, Scarlet. Welcome to the Old South and its peoples, passions, splendors, and scandals. 
Meet Chess Standish, a still magnolia who rises from the ashes of the Civil War to become the toast of society and a woman caught between the attentions of two powerful men. Like Scarlet, Chess is a woman to be reckoned with, and like Scarlet, this novel transports us to a beguiling time and place and immerses us in a dramatic saga that we wish would never end. That sounds really good. So... It was book eight. Book number nine. We have another thick book. This has got, I believe, three books in one. Yes. This is Bygones, November of the Heart, and Family Blessings by Lavril Spencer. Thick, thick book. This is what the book looks like. You can tell it's been lived. There's some marker there. And then this is what it's about. Oh, okay. Bygones, divorcee Bess Curran has built a successful career as an interior designer in historic Stillwater, Minnesota. Though still angry with her ex-husband, Michael, for abandoning their marriage, she's proud of their children, 21-year-old Lisa and 19-year-old Randy. When Lisa announces that she is pregnant and plans to marry... Michael and Bess rarely come together to help organize the wedding, and before long their own spark is rekindled. Though their parting was acrimonious, Michael and Bess re-examine their roles in the divorce and gradually come to terms with each other. Longing for that once-upon-a-time togetherness, they are forced to consider whether 20 years of love can be erased by a legal decree and whether sometimes when times change, people don't change along with them. Then we have November of the Heart. Set at the end of the 1800s, November of the Heart tells the story of Lorna Barnett, a young woman from a wealthy St. Paul family, and Jen Harkin, the ambitious dreamer who works in the kitchen of her family's summer estate. When Jen overhears her father's plans to complete the summer regatta, he brazenly crosses the line between master and servant by offering to design and build a boat that is sure to win. As the new boat comes together, so does their relationship between Lorna and Jens. And despite the rigid caste system that keeps them apart, they embark on an affair as fresh and innocent as the summer itself. But the repercussions of their passionate idols soon separate them against their wills, forcing them through buried scandal and shame to endure a loneliness where it always, where it is always November of the heart. Family Blessings. 44-year-old widow Lee Ristone takes great pleasure in life with her three children and thriving florist business, and like most people, she cannot imagine how she will cope if that, of, if that which is most precious is taken from her. Then Lee's life is turned upside down. Her oldest son Greg is killed in a motorcycle accident. In her anguish and grief, she turns to police officer Christopher Lalek. Greg's best friend. Together they grieve and together they begin to heal as their friendship blossoms. Chris becomes more and more part of the family and soon really realizes she's experiencing feelings she never thought she'd feel again and wonders what the world would think of their unexpected love affair. She finds her answer close to home for her own daughter has feelings for Chris. The family that was once the core of her existence becomes a mixed blessing, Lee must confront her children to understand where family ties end and a woman's need for love begins. Wow, that sounds like a pretty intense book. Or shall I say three books? And last but not least, we have The Elusive Flame by Kathleen Wood Woodowis. And I really like her books. I've read her books before. This is what the book looks like. This is a 1998, <laughs> excuse me, and this is what it's about. A sweeping tale of passion, romance, and adventure, Kathleen Woodowist's groundbreaking classic, The Flame and the Flower, remains as beloved today as it first appeared. Now, at long last, the author, whose name has become synonymous with top-quality romantic historical fictions, continues the story that has enchanted the world for decades. Serenice Kendall has been left destitute following the death of her doting patron. A brilliant young artist, Serenice must now turn to a childhood companion for assistance, the dashing sea captain Burgard Birmingham, and beg him to provide 
her with passage to the Carolinas. She seeks a new life across the waters, but all depends on the kindness of a charming adventurer who was once the object of her youthful infatuation. Beneath Birmingham's rugged exterior beats a heart as large and wild as the Atlantic, and Beau readily agrees to aid Serenice, even offering her his name in marriage, albeit temporarily to protect his longtime friend from scandal. But perilous secrets, determined enemies, and tempest of the seas and soul threaten their future and save passage, even as bonds of camaraderie are miraculously reforged as bonds of, desi of desire and affection becomes passion and love. So there you go. The 10 books today. Everything's in the description below. Leave me a comment in my comment section. Come say hello to me. And whatever time zone you're in, I hope you have a great one. I'll see you soon. Bye.